So there we go. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm glad to be able to welcome two folks who are good friends of BISG and um, the two of the more engaging folks that we could possibly ask to talk about operational efficiencies. When we, when we came up with this as a topic, uh, my immediate reaction was, no one's gonna wanna go to that panel. And then I thought, but what if we get people who are really excited about operational efficiencies to talk about them? And that naturally led us to Tyler Carey, who's the Chief Revenue Officer for Westchester Publishing Services, and Patricia Stockland, um, who's had a, a storied career in a lot of educational and children's publishing, and is currently the founder and CEO, or I guess uh, co-founder and CEO of Kind World Publishing based in Minneapolis. Uh, and they're here to type today to talk to us about their list of the top 10 operational efficiencies for every organization, uh, including yours. So we're gonna start here. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, so I'll go first. This is either a David Letterman top 10 list or a BuzzFeed top 10 list, depending on your perspective, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, top 10 item to organize operational efficiencies for every organization uh, is to centralize documentation and procedures in bite-sized pieces. Um, so I recommend using easy to access consistent tools across your organization to package documentation and procedures into simple digestible chunks of information. Um, the reason being is that if staff need to refresh themselves on how to generate a particular type of report, handle a situation, find that client rate card, they don't want to wade through or hold down control F and wade through a whole 180 page handbook or Salesforce, you know, uh, you know, kind of account record, that kind of thing. Um, Wiki like simplicity really helps here. So at Westchester, we use Dropbox paper as Dropbox paper is baked into the overall Dropbox ecosystem we use across our global operation. And there's a paper doc for every individual task report or need and larger docs indexing those with easy to use search functionality. So this saves time on everything from onboarding new staff to training to refreshing staff on tasks they don't do regularly, finding information for RFPs and more. So find the right tools for your company, provide them consistently across the org and set the appropriate role-based access and then encourage folks to participate and add content so they get used to using it. And this will minimize the number of where do I find emails, errors on invoices and so much more. All right, hi everyone. Um, I've got my David Letterman style mug here. So I'm gonna go ahead and date myself on this. Um, but moving right into number nine, um, identify why miscommunication or overcommunication happens in your organization. Uh, we work in a content industry. You'd think we'd have communications down pat, um, but we really see this in a lot of different places. Um, and it can happen in big companies, small companies, all across the spectrum. But really, I think the distributed folks all over the place due to COVID has only exacerbated this. Um, and so if you're seeing these pop up, they can be indicative of larger communication problems. So it's great to stop and ask yourself, how are staff and managers engaging and communicating? Do they feel in the the rank and file that their managers know they exist anymore at this point. We don't have the flyby, the cubicle or desk or office um, situation is readily available as we did 13 months ago. Um, and so it may be time to reach out and do it on a human level instead. Um, and there's not a one size fits all solution to uh, communication issues like this. Some departments benefit from once week stand up meetings um, where there isn't much interaction, but you can do a flyover on priorities. Others do lunch. And I think we've done this in all kinds of different iterations, happy hours as well via Zoom um, and really get into crosstalk and collaboration. Um, and other people really benefit from maybe a one-to-one -one meeting instead. And so really dig into this and figure out what people need on an individual level level and team level to feel heard um, and get the tools in place to accomplish what needs to be done. Oh, also, don't forget, not everything needs to be a video conference. Their phones still work as telephones too. Excellent. Um, number eight, ensure that you're exploiting all available channels and formats for your content. Uh, so as Patricia just referenced, you know, publishing and media are industries that are continuously in flux. So knowing the market trends and headlines isn't enough. Um, speak with your customers regularly. Uh, you know, they're your best user of your content. They understand what's working, what doesn't. So find new ways to engage with them to better understand how they're using your products or services, what they're looking for, what your competition are doing differently. 
Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, some publishers said that author tours were done, but others pivoted rapidly and set up virtual author events within days of the March 2020 lockdown going into effect. Uh, in the educational content space, some publishers and ed tech firms were way ahead of others by having anticipated the needs for hybrid and distance learning products due to discussions with school districts about these emerging needs years ago. Uh, so think about what formats and on what platforms your competitors are selling their content, how they're engaging with their customers differently. Um, you know, what are the things in your organization that you can refine by looking outside your own walls? All right, this is my favorite one maybe, so I'll try to keep it short. Number seven, remove antiquated steps from internal processes. Um, sometimes, especially over lengths of time, we all overbuild our processes. And I firmly believe just like household goods, a company's core processes should be checked, repaired, and maybe purged on a regular basis. Um, and really, if you are concerned about the sustainability of your business, and everyone should be, um, evaluating your processes on a regular basis is, is critical. Um, and if you're finding in that evaluation that people or processes are standing in for in, inadequate or antiquated systems, um, that's an opportunity for you to take action. Um, the operational check-in can feel maybe overwhelming, but it can be a big time saver in the long run. So if you're looking about ways to invest in sustainability, think about the time you're going to spend on that as an investment um, in your organization across all facets of it. Um, and it can be anything from cleaner metadata to more properly handled contracts, rates, and royalties. Um, it, it really is all, all fronts are, are standing there for an opportunity to potentially tighten up, clean up a process, clean up systems, and get the right tools in place that you need to get a job done effectively. All righty. Um, resources are precious. Treat them so. Um, so Patricia came up with this one. I might ask her to toss in her two cents if I don't cover all the right points. But uh, I think a lot of us learned this uh, lesson over the past year if we hadn't known it already. But it's important to have a culture where it's okay to experiment and fail. And also to kind of measure those experiments and, you know, see what's working. You know, sometimes it's time to pull the plug on a project or an initiative. So your resources are supporting the projects that really help move the ball forward. But that's not a failure. That's trying and experimenting, seeing what works, learning from the mistakes, and keeping moving forward. So measure what you can, what you do, so that you can evaluate it accordingly. Uh, it'll allow for smart resource allocation. So KPIs, surveys, and most importantly, open channels for communication across the hierarchy really help support this to know what's working, where things are moving forward, what clients are reacting well to, what's helping drive revenue. Excellent. So number five, borrow efficiencies from others. No one's looking. Um, it, it is okay to not have to originate every single idea to solve every single problem. Um, I think that we've sometimes overlooked the opportunity to borrow ideas outside of the publishing um, world. And there are all kinds of great innovations that we can do to be more efficient in our own organization. Um, and I think another area of opportunity for this one is to look to systems from vendors um, that are built around shared experiences. The reason why why a lot of these groups are able to bring really effective solutions to bear is that they have taken the time to look at individual publishers and bring those similarities together. And as much as we'd like to think in our organizations that the way we do things is unique and special unto ourselves, um, it, it really sometimes can be a um, roadblock to uh, being operationally efficient. Alrighty, number four, empowering people is a superpower. Make it a requirement for managers. Um, indecision is not efficient. Uh, so if your team is empowered to act, isn't, um, if your team is empowered to act, uh, if you don't need a dozen meetings and reply all email threads that are two dozen responses deep to reach an answer, then you can quickly move and respond to market needs more effectively. There can end up being this you know, moment where everybody feels stick, uh, stuck worrying about um, sharing bad news, how to address a problem. So, you know, create some trust, create a culture where, you know, these kinds of experiments and failure um, are things that we learn from. So empowerment, when we're taking lessons from the bad and amplifying the good can really help drive innovation. Um, so again, create an environment where there's empathy and not a fear of failure, uh, flatten the hierarchy as far as communications on how projects are going and remove any roadblocks that bog down progress. 
uh, and related to one of the previous items, providing the right current tools where they're needed to support growth will really help empower people to be successful and not cling to kind of old bad habits. And I saw a question in the Q&A there. We'll touch on that at the end if we have some uh, further time. All right, um, number three, got sales service friction, reduce it. Um, this, uh, go back, um, was Tyler's excellent contribution, but I'm gonna try to do an attempt of summarizing my thoughts on this and then have him clean it up. Uh, but I think everybody is familiar with this, regardless of what um, type of business you might be um, involved in, the excellent sales folks have sold an excellent thing. And then as it gets back into the organization and to the folks who are tasked with executing on the excellent thing, maybe don't have all the information they needed or have a different version of capturing. And by the time what was sold gets back to the client, the client isn't quite sure what they were just sold. Maybe there's extra parts, maybe it's missing parts, maybe it cost more than they're originally told. Um, so there's an opportunity to smooth this out by capturing information from your sales team in a more shared way, a more efficient way. It may be through a CRM, which hopefully you have some version of in place, um, but the opportunity to not block um, your team from that conversation, from that shared exchange between your salespeople and your customer can really be an opportunity to open up and expedite the way in which that product gets delivered to your customer base and makes everybody happier. Exactly, and to that point, Patricia, it helps drive revenue. So, I mean, Judith has that question in the Q&A, um, but that's a perfect example of how you can convince senior management that time spent cleaning up systems needs to be prioritized. Anything that's gonna help make the company more money and make everything more efficient is a, a key piece there. Number two, practice good email etiquette. Um, so at a former company that I worked at, um, there was a New Yorker cartoon that one of the execs used to copy and paste into reply all threads that got out of control. And it was a caricature of one of Dante's circles of hell. And the caption with the devil standing around pitchforks was he clicked reply all. Um, and so uh, each company's email practices are really part of their corporate culture. Needless to say, reply all wasn't a good thing there. Um, but, you know, lead by example, if, if you're in leadership within your company or within your department, um, you know, try not to over CC, take care with reply all. Clarity and brevity are key. So, I mean, being really clear as to who needs to do what and by when um, is really important. You know, you don't bury the lead in the middle of the paragraph. So, uh, you know, what we've seen is that email within a lot of companies there are the big data dump informative messages uh, to report on things, but there can also be those really brief, I really need your help with X, Y, and Z in bullet points. And so even if it wouldn't have looked great in a term paper or in one of the books that we publish, it, it may work perfectly well within an email. Excellent. And number one, know your humans. Um, I, I don't think um, either Tyler or I can do as great of a job on this one as Kate and Randy did earlier in that excellent HR session, but it, it's important to touch on from an operational efficiency standpoint. Um, humans are the most unpredictable element in any business, and that includes publishing as well. And um, I realize it's cliche at this point, but having the right person in the right role really drives efficiency. And conversely, the wrong person can drive a lot of inefficiency and you're really not going to get to the bottom of that unless you start connecting with people on that human level and I, I will you know fully confess it can be really exciting um, from an operational operational efficiency standpoint to start geeking out over systems and cleaner processes and all the good ROI that can come from all of that but at the end of the day, if you discount your human factor, you may as well throw the whole thing out because that's really the true bottom line. And that's really who we're trying to deliver for as well. Uh, Tyler and Patricia, thank you. And uh, we have a few minutes, so maybe I could start by sharing uh, something uh, just in the, it was in the chat, uh, Margaret Thomas, uh, Patricia was just saying hello from your friends at LPG. I still have many friends there. And they said that they're really excited about your, your new endeavor. Thank you. And Tyler, you said that uh, you've, you've seen the question. So do you want to tackle that from the, from the chat? You know, sure. what I'll do is kind of wearing my sales hat, kind of uh, shoehorn uh, Judith's question about systems into sales. But, um, you know, so your question, um, was, you know, how do we convince senior management that time spent cleaning up systems needs to be prioritized? 
Um, you know, so I mean, within, you know, the organizations I've worked with, and a lot of it's just been about clearer communication between departments, um, making, you know, less staff time wasted on each project kind of thing. Um, it also helps open up um, revenue opportunities if there are clear lines of communication that come from um, whether it's service or support or editorial that are feeding back to the people designing the products or selling the products. Uh, Patricia, what have you seen in those regards? I mean, systems are a key piece for everything you do. Yeah. No, that's a really good point, Tyler. I think sometimes one of the challenges can be in talking to senior management about why the investment is important comes in that squishy factor that's hard to measure that goes back to the, the cost of human time with the extra steps. And when you're already spending a lot of extra time doing extra steps that you shouldn't need to do, it's even harder to find the time to document where is all of this, where is all this going, where is all this going? So it kind of creates this maddening circle. But at the end of the day, we're in a creative industry and we should be giving people the mind space they need to create and innovate. And so it's, at some point it needs to be, I think a bit of a leap of faith as well on um, management's part, but also trusting that when you give people more time, which is the most valuable resource, you're going to see a return on that investment. And there's a, Judith, uh, while you were speaking, uh, added a thought to the question, which is that everybody's so busy putting out fires, it's hard to step back, especially when budgets are tight. I think that the, you've both had this experience. How do you address it? And do you want to go first, Tyler? Or you want me to dive into that one? <laughs> um, I, I've, I've addressed it um, a, a few times by not starting with the whole thing, um, but starting with um, some quick wins. And so really taking the time to have those conversations across different departments and with different individuals and seeking out the problem. Um, I have intentionally gone forth looking for the squeakiest wheel because the, the person who people might have gotten to a point where they're, they're avoiding because they feel like they're so intense on this, um, maybe a great opportunity to dig in and say, okay, we can start here. And by building on those little wins and getting that stuff solved, you can start to create inertia around that for, for change. It doesn't necessarily put out the entire forest fire, but <laughs> it starts to like, hold a line. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you break the, especially when kind of there's, everything's just kind of stuck in process, um, you know, as you put it to that everybody's busy putting out fires right now, it's kind of hard to kind of prioritize some of these things. Um, you know, I think sometimes if we look at these things as business problems versus systems problems, um, that helps advance some of that dialogue. Um, you know, if you have a very outdated way of handling, you know, accounts payable and accounts receivable and a, a new system would help, that can become a very specific system discussion that comes out of the business problem. Um, but within the systems themselves, there's also the opportunity to talk to your vendors. Um, you know, so there was one company I was at where we all did not like a particular system that we had to use on a daily basis. And it had been there, you know, it's just this atavistic piece of the company. Um, it had been there since before any of us had gotten there. Uh, and ultimately just, you know, conversations with the vendors said, how are other publishers using this system? And it ends up the way it had been configured was initially implemented was the problem, um, you know, and it wasn't like it was an easy fix where, you know, a 30 minute call customer service fixed everything. But, um, you know, sometimes that comparing notes with other people in your industry that are using the same systems um, or, you know, talking to your vendor about ways to customize and, you know, kind of calibrate can help us solve a lot of these problems without having to start all, all over. So, I mean, to Patricia's point, sometimes if you look at the little tiny problems, sometimes there are quicker fixes there than it might look like. Yeah, we had a uh, a question in, in the chat just about the uh, asking if we could post the top ten list uh, one more time before we moved on to the to the next piece. So I'm doing that, um, but I'm I'm just kind of wondering, Patricia, if I might uh, ask you, you know, you've worked for medium and smaller size publishers. Now you're starting your own, but you've always had kind of a workflow or a process technology. Uh, and people perspective on all the jobs you've had. I mean, to what extent is it resource dependent and how much of it is mindset dependent? That's a great question, Brian. Um, I would say the majority of it is mindset, honestly. And, and as humans, we have a tendency to sometimes get in our own way and not realize it until we've accidentally built a system around the mindset. And that can be the tricky thing to unravel. And I, I think because once something gets built, 
and you've invested the infrastructure and time in it, it can seem even scarier to step back and say, hey, maybe we don't need all this stuff. Maybe we need to be flexible with things. And, and it's the inflexibility that creates a sustainability problem. And I think that's really what a lot of this conversation is about is how can we bake more flexibility into our industry and be able to be more responsive more quickly to what's happening. And that's a mindset piece. And Tyler, Westchester really is in the business of trying to help publishers think through some of their, you know, better, what, what best practice should be for their particular requirements. I mean, do you, how do you, how do you, do you see a, a difference in scale or is it the kind of thing that um, both smaller and medium and larger size publishers can take advantage of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fact that we work with some of the, the big five publishers and folks down to smaller scholarly presses that may have one or two employees, you know, um, shows that it, you know, looking at workflow, um, and in our case, it's editorial and production and manufacturing workflow, but looking at workflow on those topics, um, you know, affects everybody. We're, we're all victims to the supply chain. We're all victims to the same problems with editing and producing content, whether it's a book, journal, white paper, blog post. Um, you know, so I think uh, what we do see is that certainly um, it's harder to turn a battleship and speedboat if you have a, a startup new publishing house, right? You know, you can build it from the bottom up um, and there's less kind of legacy stuff that you have to fix. Um, but the discussion we have, um, whether it's a big or small publisher, we're often talking about the same kinds of systems, the same kinds of products. Um, everybody wants to talk about the things we just covered in the previous session about uh, how to make content more accessible and equitable. Um, so I think we're, we're seeing a lot of the same topics and they're amplified, not depending on size necessarily, but depending on how re ready a department or a team is to embrace those things. And I think, you know, BISG's mission, of course, is to make the supply chain your friend um, and, and not something you have to deal with. The, uh, thank you very much for making the time today for making operational efficiencies both fun and accessible uh, in, the, in the best possible sense. And uh, I'm glad that you could be part of our, our annual meeting today. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, 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 We're gonna switch gears and, and do one more content-driven uh, session, uh, in this case with Paul Randall from HP Publishing Solutions. Uh, the uh, 